Um, AMHP collaboration and, and collaboration of CIOCG and all the other organization who has helped ICN to organize this uh, webinar today on prevention of suicide. It is not easy to talk about mental illness. It impacts all of us and as a clinician, it has always impacted me when I see the pain of mental illness when they sh my client shared with me. But it also happens in the families, in, in my own family. There are people who have suffered from mental illness and it is very, very hard. And I can tell you how hard it is to witness that pain and to help somebody. What I'm going to stress to everybody that it's okay to say that I'm not okay. We don't have to pretend that I'm okay and I'm dealing, I'm doing okay. Sometimes we all hide our illness. Sometimes we all hide our anxiety, but that's not okay. It's very, very okay to say to other people that I'm not okay. Having said that, I would also like to really appreciate and thank Tabassum and her family and their courage to come out and share their experience with us and their pain with us. Having said that, let me move on to say something about family support services. Uh, I feel the world is round and my journey started with CIOCG. I remember my first meeting with uh, Mujahid in May 2007, when I approached him and I told him that I wanted to do something for my community. I wanted to start social services program. And he guided me saying, you should go back to ICN and start the program at your root level. So that's what we did. And since then, uh, we have grown forward with the help of ICN. Our program has developed and flourished, of course, with lots of struggles, but today we have seven or eight volunteers. We have four clinicians, um, Yasmin Khan, Munira Merchant, Madiha Harun, and then myself. And then we have a new uh, Arabic speaking clinician. Her name is uh, Faida Sahori. We provide helpline and people call us and then the four clinicians would take uh, the cases when it's really necessary, like if it's a mental illness or domestic violence, some senior, serious problems. But generally our volunteers are very well trained and they deal with those problems like financial, housing, schooling and all that. So unfortunately, in our experience, most calls come, I think like four fifths of the calls are about uh, these things, financial problems and housing and other matters which are dealt by volunteers. The important calls for mental illness and domestic violence, they don't come forward to us. And I think that is because of the big stigma in our community to share such problems. I feel also the lack of awareness and the reason I think people don't come forward is that they don't understand that it's a serious problem. They think, oh, I'm depressed today and it's going to go away tomorrow. Or if I'm anxious, that's part of being normal. So they don't seek help. Having said that, I think um, that's the most important thing people should do is to seek help there are tons of resources out there in the community. And that's why FSS is important for people to reach out and call the helpline for us. So I would encourage everybody to uh, call us when they feel that they need some help and there is no shame asking for help. Mental illness is like any other illness, like when we go to doctor for diabetes or we have a blood pressure, we should we all should consider that as the same thing as mental illness. Um, 
Having said that, I think um, I want to also add on to one thing. We are also planning to start uh, another service, which, are, which is in the planning stage and it's called, um, sorry, I, I have to remember the name, it's called um, Healing, Healing Circle. It's called Healing Circle and we want to launch it maybe after December, but the date is not announced and I have to discuss it with ICN. So now I would like to also stress that since mental health is important, so is spiritual health. And for spiritual uh, health and religious information, we have our own Sheikh, Dr. Sheikh Rizwan, and I would like him to come and say a few words. for the invitation and for that introduction. You know, mental health is a very serious issue that we all have to take seriously and address. And I was talking to a group of students of mine and we were talking about, I teach at a local Islamic school and we were planning activities for student council. And I said, okay, you guys come up with a list of activities that you think are the most pressing. So I thought they were gonna talk about dating or you know, drugs, alcohol, and unanimously they came up and said that mental health. So I was like, subhanAllah, okay. Um, so out of mental health, what is the issue that deserves the most priority? And they said suicide prevention. And these are our high schoolers. So we had very good conversations and a lot of questions came out of there. And I think those are some of the questions that people have about um, is mental health a real thing from an Islamic perspective? Uh, is it just lack of Iman? Um, you know, a person who commits suicide, are they in hell forever? So these type of questions, unfortunately, there's a lot of ignorance and a lot of false and lack of information about these things. So Alhamdulillah, I started to have these conversations more in smaller groups, but when I saw that this is going to be an opportunity to have these discussions from both a religious perspective and a mental health perspective, I thought that Alhamdulillah, it was a great opportunity. And I really applaud all of the people that organized this and also all of the people that are participating or will watch this and listen to this later. You know, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ مَتَمْ وَسَطَى that we have made you the middle path, right? We have made you the moderate ummah. And another uh, ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you are the best of nations, right? And one of the things that we realized is that one of the reasons we're the best of nations is because we're moderate. We don't go to extremes. So yes, we do believe that mental health is a real issue. And we do believe that there is a spiritual component in dealing with mental health issues. But that's not the only way to deal with mental health issues. Right? There are times where spirituality is very important, but also professional help is very important as well. So we need to be able to balance that. Family, friends, uh, you know, faith, family, friends, professional help, all of these things play an impact on helping people get the help that they need. And this is a fundamental aspect, right? Just Islam tells us we need to help people deal with whatever challenges that they're facing. And inshallah, when we do that, we'll be able to overcome some of those challenges that we're going through. Another question that comes up is, what about suicide? Um, does that mean that the people will be in hell forever? And there are hadith that do indicate that, but it's important to understand that there is another hadith and our other hadith that say that every individual's case will be in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where a person came to the Prophet sallallahu Jabir reported that Tufail uh, Dosi, he migrated the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when he had migrated to Medina, a man from his tribe also migrated with him. Then he fell ill and became exasperated. He took a scissor of his and cut off his hand joints. He slit his wrist. So his hands bled till he died. Tufail then saw him in his dream and he was handsome in appearance, but he found him with his hands covered. He asked him, what did your Lord do with you? He said, he has forgiven me because of my migration to his prophet. He has forgiven me because of the previous good that I've done. 
he asked, what is it that I see your hands covered? He said that it was said to him that the hands are not going to be cured. So they went to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu said, may Allah forgive his two hands and cure his two hands. So the Prophet Sallallahu didn't say that he's in Jahannam, but the Prophet Sallallahu confirmed that this person who, you know, did commit this act of suicide, he will be in Jannah. So there are situations that we see things from the outside and we can't make assumptions. We can't make judgments that people are either in Jannah or Jahannam. We say that we have hope that and anticipation and expect the best from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we see things on the surface, but people are suffering inside and we have no idea. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arham ar-rahimin, the most merciful of those that show mercy. He knows, he sees, and he recognizes, and he will hold people accountable. So if we ever say that, oh, I can't believe the person did this and there, that, that, and that, that's none of our responsibility. And it's challenging the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please be very, very careful and have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the person going through the challenge, whatever challenges that they are facing in this dunya, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remove those challenges for them in the akhirah and always be positive and optimistic. Another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu which I want to remind myself and all of you of. Whenever you hear people making this judgmental comments, I can't believe the person did that or uh, why did they do that? all of these things, right? There's a hadith also in Sahih Muslim where Jundub radiallahu anhu reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man said, by Allah, Allah will not forgive this person, right? The person thought that person did, uh, the other person did something so bad that Allah will never forgive that person. So on the day of judgment, what happens is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will call both of them. And he said, who is the one who swore my, by me that I will not forgive someone? And then the person said, I, he said, I have forgiven him but I have not forgiven you. So if we say that there's no way Allah would forgive a person who does this and does that, right? That's not our authority. We have no authority to say that, right? And so what we do is we make dua for people that are struggling and we don't know, even, we may not even know that they're struggling. We want good for them. We try to help them and we put our tawakkul and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Part of tawakkul and trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that we do whatever is within our capacity. We increase our spirituality. We increase our relationship with our friends, our family, and get mental health help, right? And inshallah, and then we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, I think Brother Kashif later is going to be talking about, you know, uh, mental health first aid. And this is something which is very, very important for us as Muslims to try to participate in and just be there to help people. Listen, help guide you don't have to make any diagnosis you don't have to go beyond your means but just help people connect to others that are qualified and trained then inshallah it really has the potential of saving people's lives and another thing that we know is that one thing that will really help people right going through um, a lot of different issues is just having someone close to them that they can trust and they can talk to and they can open up with, right? So these are very important things that we can take. And from an Islamic perspective, our uh, uh, obligation, our goal, our objective is to make sure that people get the help that they need in whatever capacity they can. A lot of times people come to me uh, in terms of marriage issues. And yes, there might be a small spiritual component, but they usually I refer them to a marriage counselor, family therapist, because the bigger issues are communication. If somebody came to me as an imam that has a physical ailment, right, physical injury, and they need rehab, I wouldn't just tell them, okay, read more Quran or do more dhikr, but I tell them, yes, read more Quran, do more dhikr, but also, you know, go do rehab and get things done uh, with a doctor. Similarly, if somebody comes to me as an imam with a mental health issue, I will tell them that, you know, increasing the recitation of Quran, do more dhikr, but also go see a mental health professional and with family support services and others there um, alhamdulillah many opportunities so our responsibility as practicing muslims who want to truly uphold the tradition of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is to help people get the help that they need and we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives us all hidayah and tawfiq and uh, i'll end with this you know sometimes we think that these things are theoretical and you know, why are we spending time on this? This is something that happens in other communities, but wallahi, it doesn't. It can happen very close to home, and it has happened very close to home. And I want to uh, take this moment to commend Nasir and uh, Halim family 
for opening it up and helping us as a community understand and try to remove some of the stigma surrounding this issue. And I remember when I met the family, one of the things that I advised them uh, was that turn whatever emotions that you're going through right now to positive positivity and do things that are positive. And this is one of the most positive things that they could have done is to raise awareness about this issue. And I really commend them for doing that. It takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of uh, sacrifices to be able to do that. But inshallah, they've done it and let's all benefit and try to help in whatever capacity that we can. Inshallah, I'd like Nasir Halim, uh, a youth from our community who has very firsthand experience of dealing with a family member who has lost his life to share some of his experiences and let us know how we can help and be part of the solution, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you, Sheikh Rizwan. Um, I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm gonna try to just talk. So uh, before anything else, like I wanted to say thank you to our community and assalamu alaikum to our community um, for, uh, thank you for supporting our family throughout all of this. Like this has been about as painful of a, uh, time as can be imagined. And uh, I, I wanna support what Sheikh Rizwan said of uh, sometimes this discussion can get theoretical of talking about mental health. Um, and it's hard to relate that to your own family unless it happens. And I will say right now is that before that, before Armand took his own life, I never imagined that this would be us. It was just impossible to comprehend it. I, I couldn't put myself in those shoes. And yet after this, like after it's happened, after this has happened to our family and this is the reality that we're in, I just, I, I want everyone to understand that we come from a very privileged background or at least my family does. And I've felt that every single day with how much support that we get and how, and how, much, um, how many resources that we have available to us. And like, please, like I implore people in the community to understand that this isn't the case for everybody. Like there are so many stories where, where this exact same thing happened, but, and then the family will then like, have a very difficult time dealing with it because they don't have the resources to handle it. So to the families that, so, so please like open your hearts to, to, to anybody that is going through the struggle, like no matter what. Um, so I just want to say that, you know, very briefly. Um, again, uh, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Nasser Halim. Um, I am the youngest of four brothers. Uh, my parents are Azim Halim and Tabassum Halim. And I am a 23-year-old. Uh, I just gra I graduated from Northwestern University uh, in June of 2020. And um, and my oldest brother Azam is an uh, ER uh, physician working in um, working in Michigan. And my second oldest brother uh, Miraj Halim is working in New York City as a resident. And uh, uh, also as a medical resident. Um, my, and so, and my brother Arman was a fourth year medical student at uh, MCW, Medical College of Wisconsin uh, in Milwaukee. Um, so I want to quick, and before anything else, I, I will also say this, um, the pain that my family is going through has become like pretty normalized for us or the, so I, as I tell a little bit about Armand's story, if there's anything shocking or that is hard to hear, like I apologize right now. The truth is again, like this has become very normalized for us and it might not be normalized for anybody else. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so I'll say, so right off the bat, um, you know, I just want to talk about my, about my brother Armand. Uh, he was three years or he is three years older than I am. And uh, um, so, and he was born in 1995, I was born in 1997. So growing up, we were extremely close um, through every single year of our lives. 
uh, at like we we just we had a wonderful relationship with each other and for all my brothers it has been that way we just have always had a wonderful relationship with each other we respect each other of course we have our we had our conflicts but it was never it, it, it they never lasted long and so for me and Armand like we we had just the most beautiful time growing up together um, and he was the hardest working person that I knew and he was extremely successful and all through high school and college, like he, he just excelled at whatever he did. Um, every, he, he would come home and talk about tests that he took where he would just completely like just be the highest in the class or just completely knock it out of the park. And he, he, he was always so high performing. He had that standard for himself. Um, unfortunately, I think w what concerned me throughout the years is that for all of his successes, he didn't get that much joy from it. And I, I noticed that early on, but throughout the years, it became a little bit more pronounced. Um, and so um, after he took his MCAT um, in his senior year, so during his senior year of college, that is when some struggles of his became a little bit more pronounced, where he would talk about how he just felt very tired, very burnt out. And even though he got in, he got into MCW, he did get into medical school. He didn't, again, he did not feel the joy from that as you might expect from somebody. So, um, but yeah, but that, that's when his struggles really started, really started was, was in his senior year of college. Um, again, he felt very tired. He couldn't put a name on it. Just didn't really understand what was going on. Um, starting his first year of medical school is when his troubles like first started to become apparent to the rest of us um, because he struggled a lot um, as far as school was concerned beginning in medical school and for the rest of the family like this was very surprising this was the first time that we had ever seen him struggle academically and you know alhamdulillah he was able to push through a lot of these a lot of the academic struggles they went through, but there were a lot of underlying questions of like, why did this happen now? What exactly is going on? And all that, but he just, he, he, he was able to push through it, but he, he, he struggled through it. Um, and I, I would always call him on the phone. We, we talked weekly uh, and I had a difficult time in college, like starting from the beginning. And it, it, um, and he was, uh, and he was just like a great resource for me. But throughout my years of college, like I would notice in our conversations, he just got more and more despondent, more and more sad about the way that medical school was going. And it was just hard for me to understand because he was, he was actually pushing through, he was doing well. It just didn't seem to matter to him. Um, and, and then in the, um, I, I'll say, Thanksgiving of last year of 2019 is when it became uh, very much, very much apparent as to what that something very bad was happening with to him, with him. Um, he opened up to me and said that he was very suspicious of the other people around him. He felt that uh, the other, that there were other students at the school, that there were doctors, nurses, whoever in the hospital, and he felt like they were always out to get him. And before that, he had shared with me that he was, you know, that he, that he felt, you know, very challenged by the other students there that, you know, that there was some backbiting or whatever going on. And that's, you know, frankly, it's a professional environment. Like sometimes that's what happens, but this was the first time where he just put a blanket statement out and said, everybody is out to get me. And I, at that point, it became very real for me, and I didn't know what to do. Um, and yeah, and and from that point on, Armand degraded mentally extremely quickly. Um, and even though professionally he was he was very successful at that time, he was doing great. Um, and you know he 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 you know he was he was doing well, but like again, like whenever I was on the phone with him, he would just get suspicious of our family, of 
his friends, people close to him, he felt like his problems at school followed him home, all these things. Like it was, it was just difficult to talk with him because like he was talking on a level I didn't understand. Um, and I'll say after quarantine, so we both came back home in March of 2020. Uh, he came back home from MCW and during the, in all of Ramadan that we we're fasting together for that entire month, he gave me probably the greatest window into his mind that I, that I have ever gotten to that point. And truly like every day of Ramadan, we would come downstairs and he would share with me all of his fears, all of his, well, not all of it. I'm, and that's the big thing. It wasn't all of it. He just felt like he, he just felt like all these people are out to get him. And he was so worried. Um, he was just despondent about his future. I would ask him like, Armand, like what, you're doing fine. And you know, like, you know, but like, I don't understand. He said, you know, it doesn't matter anymore. Like nothing matters. Like it's over. Like uh, all the damage that people could have done to my career, they've done it. I, and it was just hard for me to understand. And every single day it was like that. And I try to talk him down and he never wanted to be reassured about anything. Um, and after that, he, he, he continued to degrade. Um, un and unfortunately, like a lot, his illness, whatever it was, it led to some moments of incredible rage where he would come back home from MCW and at this point, he was very suspicious of my parents, and he would yell at them, just, just, and say horrible things. And there was no rhyme or reason. We, again, I can't stress this enough. We didn't understand what was happening, but he was, but he would yell at us, and then, and then go back, go, go drive back up to Milwaukee, and that would be that. Um, and it continued like that. And at, at one point. For, for me, a very difficult part of this was that me and my brothers, we got on the phone with Armand and we tried to, we try to share with him like our experiences of what he was going through, like saying like, we had noticed these changes in his behavior and like, this is how it was, a, and, and like, that it was a real problem that he needed to get help. And he just didn't want to hear it. Just never wanted to hear it. Um, there are some points when he wanted to go, where, the, at one point, he did go and get a psychiat uh, not psychiatric eval, but he did go to a um, psychiatrist and, um, you know, was prescribed medication or something, but he just, he never saw a therapist regularly, which was the big problem. Uh, and, and at some point, and he just became very adamant that he did not want his struggle to uh, be open up to anyone else because he felt like it would ruin his career. He felt like there was that people would be talking about him or what the whole gamut. I, I, it's, it, it's kind of hard to go through. <laughs> um, and this all led to, uh, on October 23rd, uh, Armand came home and he was very agitated that day. And my oldest brother, Azam, came to celebrate my birthday, which is October 24th. And he came with his family and Armand had come like just unannounced. And we had, and he was very agitated that whole day. So I spent the day with Armand, um, try to get him out of the house, just have a good time with him somewhere else because he couldn't be at home. And um, we were able to get through that day. And on October 24th, me and my family, we went, me, my oldest brother and my parents, we decided we were going to go to an apple orchard um, that's about an hour away from our home. And, um, and I asked Armand if he wanted to come with us. And he said, no, he said he would just stay at home. And while we, while me and my parents and my oldest brother and his family, while we were over in the apple orchard an hour away from home, Armand took his own life. It is the most painful thing that I can ever imagine experiencing in my life. I've broken my wrist and my collarbone 
um, at various points in my life. And I would take the pain of that a million times over versus what we've gone through for the past, however long it's been now. Um, because I knew that those things would get better and not right now, Armand is gone forever. And that's just how it is. Um, so right now, what I, what, I, what I do want to talk about is the main things that prevented Armand from seeking help. Um, first, I, I, the first thing that stopped him from seeking help was fear. He was scared of the damage that it would do to his career if he went and got a, a psychiatric evaluation and they labeled him with a mental health uh, diagnosis. Um, I think he felt that, and rightly or wrongly, he felt that if that happened, then his career was over before it really even started. That if he got labeled with something serious, then it would be over. And you know, I, at some, and, and on some level, I do understand that, but it, it's neither here nor there. Um, I think second, he felt a, a very distinct fear to his reputation. He did not want people to talk about him and, cons you know, and just think of him as being that person. Um, uh, uh, think of him in terms of his mental health illness. And then lastly, I think he felt a fear of the overall process of getting help for mental health illnesses. Um, as I said, like he briefly went on medi like was taking medicine uh, to, to balance out his, his like his um, just emotional state, mental state. And he didn't like it because he felt like he felt nothing when he was doing that. Um, he was worried about the lack of privacy. He was worried about what it would be like to talk to a therapist all of these things. Um, so again, I, I, I want to I stress this. The thing that stopped him from getting help was fear. He was just scared to do that. Um, and going forward for this community, the thing is like there is such a push for like for success, toward success that is so commendable. Like our community is so blessed to be as successful as we are. But with that, there needs to be, this needs to go hand in hand with offering support when people are in times of need. And that means stressing the importance of listening, of being empathetic and being very honest with ourselves and with the situations of our families. When, when that time comes to get help, because it, it can be very easy to, to write this off as something that just will not happen until it happens and and that's that's just how it is and um i would say and lastly i want to touch on my like all the only recommendations that i can think of if you're seeking mental health treatment um i would say first and foremost be honest with yourself be honest with the professional the the key issue is that arman was not willing to be honest with a professional because he felt that if he told them the whole story of everything that he was going through, of the voices that he heard in his head or whatever, then they would label him with something that would be very, very destructive to his career. Um, that can't be the primary focus. Like your mental health is the primary focus. It needs to be the primary focus, not professional success, not educational success. It needs to be mental health. That's above everything else. Um, and also like write down concerns, like going into therapy, write down your own concerns, talking to that psychiatrist for the first time. Um, I, there's, there's, uh, that, I mean, just, just need to be open on that front. If you're scared of taking medication, if you're scared of, of what people are gonna think about with you, then that whoever that mental health professional is can probably um, you know, convince you otherwise. Um, and yeah, finally, I wanna say like, these next few months for our community are gonna be extremely difficult, um, especially as it's related to COVID, to, to, to coronavirus. 
many of us like we can't like we just can't go places and it's cold it's very painful um and that means that th that these struggles are going to come up more and more for us so there is a very distinct need for us to take these issues seriously especially in our own families so yeah so i will so i'll leave my piece there and um Right now, I want to, um, first of all, thank you for, thank you all for listening to me. Um, thank you for being there for my family. And right now, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, who is Yasmin Irfani. Um, she is the Youth Programs Director at the National Alliance on Mental, Mental Illness in the greater Los Angeles area in California. She received her master's in college counseling and student services. She is a QPR suicide prevention instructor as well as a youth and adult mental health first aid instructor through American Health, American Muslim Health Professionals. Okay, um, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Uh, I'd like to first just acknowledge this beautiful um, sharing from Brother Nasser. I, my heart is beating so fast just hearing the story and it's the first time I've seen any Muslim family open up about this. So thank you so much. And as Sister Shamim had said in the beginning, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay for us to cry and feel our emotions. In fact, we should. If We really should. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment to um, acknowledge what was just shared. Okay, I'm gonna start my timer so I don't go over. Um, so I do wanna just share a trigger warning. Um, suicide is a very heavy topic and it's one of the most complex and difficult to understand of all human behaviors. And it's never due to just one reason alone. So please take care of yourself. Um, one thing that I do is I, um, have, I put my hand over my heart. It's a self-soothing technique. And um, just, it's important for us to be there for ourselves and take care of our own mental health if we want to be there to be able to help anybody else. And I also want to acknowledge that sometimes despite our best efforts and all the education training, everything that we do, suicide still happens. And we need to really be gentle and compassionate and non-judgmental with this subject um, because too much is on the line. I also wanna share that in this brief time that I have with you, there's so much that we could go over, but there will be points that I miss and we will have a Q&A later on. And I really encourage you to become certified and trained in these actual trainings so that you can get the full picture. Okay, so I have a short PowerPoint for you so that you can have visuals. I also wanna make sure everybody knows of the resources that exist. There's the 24 seven suicide prevention lifeline, a crisis text line, and then there's also Nasiha mental health. Everyone should have these in their phones saved and be aware of these resources at all times. It's also really important to focus on language. So instead of saying committed suicide, it's better to say someone died by suicide in the same way that we wouldn't say someone committed cancer or committed a heart attack. Suicide is death due to brain illness. And the word commit uh, can be associated with a lot of negative connotations. We also don't wanna say suicidal person, it's more appropriate to say a person at risk of suicide because this does not define them. And similarly, instead of saying a mentally ill person, we can say a person living with mental health needs. It's also really important to face the statistics and the reality. So every 11 minutes, someone dies by suicide in the US and every 40 seconds, someone dies by suicide in the world. 
So in the short time that we have together, there are people taking their own lives at such an alarming rate that it's actually infuriating that why is it not mandatory for all leaders, all community members to become trained in suicide prevention when this is the most preventable form of death? So in total, each year we lose 800,000 of our sisters and brothers. And these numbers are probably underreported because of the stigma, the shame, the fear. And this visual can show you how the numbers have been increasing over the past two decades and they're off the charts. Yet we must have hope because each suicide prevention is each person's responsibility and regardless of anything. So I want to mention a few of the myths. First, people who talk about suicide are attention seekers. This could not be farther from the truth. And unfortunately, this is what we hear in our community, whether it's said in different words or these ones. If somebody is talking about suicide and they're at such a low point, they're not attention seekers. They are attention needers. They deserve all of the support and love and care. Next, if you ask someone about suicide, it might plant the idea in their head. This is a huge myth. There is no way you can plant the idea of suicide in another person's mind. And this is what gets in the way of really important conversations. Third, if you ask someone about suicidal thoughts or plans, this will increase the risk of suicide. That is also false. When you are able to directly ask someone about suicide or if they want to kill themselves, it serves as a relief that they can talk about any topic with you and it relieves anxiety. So it's important to also know of some of the warning signs and this list does not include everything. So please become trained um, uh, afterwards. So some I can point out are feeling like a burden, having a negative view of oneself, substance abuse, frequently talking about death, isolation and feeling alone. There is so much. And we need to, everyone needs to be aware of these and we need to have the courage to point them out and not just brush these things under the rug. So I want to focus on some do's and don'ts as well. So we want do stay calm and grounded. Even right now, I feel like my heart is beating so fast, yet we need to, um, as community members, be a duck on the pond, as we say in mental health first aid. So a duck is swimming very smoothly on the surface, but under the water, its feet are paddling really fast. So even if we are panicking inside, we need to stay calm for that person. And remain patient. Everyone is on their own journey. And unfortunately, there's, uh, there tends to be a delay in seeking help and treatment for mental health. So at your first suggestion for therapy, someone might not just go ahead and sign up. It might be a process and we have to be patient. Third, take care of your own mental health in your daily life. Like I said earlier, if, for example, if I can't sit with my fears, anxieties, vulnerabilities, if somebody comes to me and shares some of theirs, I'll be too emotionally triggered to support them and I could make the situation worse. So it really does start with our own selves. And I think this is not emphasized enough. Um, the piece about having self-compassion and self-care in our communities. It's not selfish, it's necessary. And you taking care of your mental health will indirectly serve as a gift to every single person around you. Next, uh, always share resources and hotlines like the one I mentioned earlier. You want to be aware of these. And if someone is showing signs or is going through any mental health challenges, don't just leave them hanging, like give them the resources. Now let's talk about some don'ts, which is my favorite. <laughs> uh, okay, do not make jokes about suicide. It's not funny. 
um, if, if somebody jokes around about it, like whether it's teenagers or anyone, call them out and use, them as a, use that as a gentle, teachable moment by sharing the statistics and sharing why um, it's, it's not something that should be joked around about. Next is do not give advice until the person is ready. What you can do instead is you can ask, what can I do to support you? And then let the person tell us because let's face it, our community loves to give advice, um, especially when it's not asked for. And especially if someone is in a crisis or uh, going through mental health challenges, they may not be able to think clearly. So it, it's actually not helpful. And if you really want to give advice, maybe you can ask them, do you want advice? And rather than just bombarding it onto them. So it may come from a good intention, but we need to think about the impact. Next, do not make false promises. I'm not going to tell a youth, oh, call me anytime, text me, I'm here for you, no matter what unless I'm going to be able to follow through with that. We need to um, really follow up with the commitments that we make. And the last one I'll share is do not use guilt or threats to try to prevent suicide. Saying things like, you'll go to hell, that's haram, stuck for Allah, you'll ruin other people's lives by killing yourself. This is not helpful. And we cannot let our own fear get in the way and project that onto those who are courageous enough to share how they're really feeling in a society, in a world which wants us to just shove all the emotions down. So, and I'm, I'm sorry if I feel like I'm talking at you, but I'm, I'm trying my best. Okay, so there's a few more things that I want to emphasize, and then I will show a powerful video, and then I'll pass it on, um, pass the mic. So this first one is to listen non-judgmentally. Easier said than done, right? Oh, uh, like when we're with someone we care about, we just want to respond and save them, rescue them, but it actually is more beneficial. One powerful example is um, this officer named Kevin Briggs, he has talked down over 200 people from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. How? Simply through listening non-judgmentally. This is one example of this man who stood there for 90 minutes and on his own after being heard, he decided to come back over. And that's there's like over 200 people who have um, done that. So it show, it's very powerful. And at the bottom, I have an example of what you can say, which is, I don't even know what to say, but I'm here for you, or I'm here to listen. We don't have to be perfect. We don't, none of us has the right thing to say. But what matters is that we're showing care and concern. My next tip is to have a heart to heart not a brain to brain. So now is not the time for uh, being logical and analytical and all of that. We want to connect on our human level, a heart to heart. That is way more healing. And just um, being there to witness the other person's feelings and be that safe person, which goes back to take care of your own mental health. Otherwise, you might not be able to be as beneficial. And if you're having tons of thoughts in your head about, oh, what do, what do I say? Before you speak, you can ask yourself, is what I'm going to say going to be helpful to this person in this moment? For example, telling them to pray more, have more faith, is that really going to be helpful when they're in this vulnerable state and they're not able to think clearly? And the last tip is to ask the question directly. This image is of Kevin Hines, who is a suicide survivor. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge in the year 2000 and Allah saved him. His 
story is a miracle. And now he goes around the world sharing his story. And sh one of the main things is he says, if even one person had said something like, are you okay? Why are you crying? Or just acknowledged him, he wouldn't have jumped, but he was having hallucinations and all, he had all these different mental health challenges that made him believe that he needed to jump. So if you're seeing many warning signs, I encourage you to be direct and you can say, are you thinking of killing yourself or are you thinking of suicide? And that's not enough. You also want to ask about the person's plans and intent to act on those thoughts. And if you want to go more in depth with all of these different tools, um, we have a QPR training. It stands for asking the question, persuading the person to get help, and referring them to the appropriate resources. We don't have to have all the answers, but each of us does have a responsibility to get our um, community members to the appropriate help. And I also should say that it's very, it's tricky because this is by a case by case basis. So if you're in a situation, you always want to consult and get advice for your specific um, circumstance. But what I'm sharing is just kind of a general one, which um, a general overview. Okay, so let me see. Oh, perfect. I have just enough time to show you a video and then I will close and pass the mic. So this video is to show that oops, so what sometimes suicide will still happen as we know we cannot stop all all deaths by suicide but for those who are left behind and for those who are going through any grief or trauma this video is what we can apply to our lives to to be um, the best helpers that we can be what do we do about all the pain we see in the world all the pain we feel in our own lives and why does it seem like our best efforts to help somebody feel better always backfire I've been studying intense grief and loss, baby death, violent crimes, accidents, suicides, and natural disasters. And I've learned something really interesting. Cheering people up, telling them to be strong and persevere, helping them move on, it doesn't actually work. It's kind of a puzzle. It seems counterintuitive, but the way to help someone feel better is to let them be in pain. This is true for those giant losses and the ordinary everyday ones. Educator Parker Palmer writes, the human soul doesn't want to be advised or fixed or saved. It simply wants to be witnessed exactly as it is. He's talking about acknowledgement here. Acknowledgement is this really amazing multi-tool. It makes things better even when they can't be made right. For example, somebody's struggling. Their baby died or there's been a bad accident or their mom got sick and they're just sad it's way more helpful to join them in their pain than it is to cheer them up. But here's what we tend to do instead. You have two other children, you need to find joy in them. Or, you know what you need? You just need to go out dancing and shake it off. Or, I felt really sad once. Did you try acupuncture? We're not really sure what to do with someone's pain, so we do what we've been taught. We look on the bright side. We try to make people feel better. We give them advice. It's not like this is nefarious. I mean, we try to cheer people up because we think that's our job. We're not supposed to let people stay sad. The problem is, you can't heal somebody's pain by trying to take it away from them. Now, acknowledgement does something different. When a giant hole opens up in someone's life, it's actually much more supportive to acknowledge that hole and let pain exist. It's actually a radical act to let things hurt. It goes against what we've been taught. In order to really support you, I have to acknowledge that things really are as bad as they feel to you. If I try to cheer you up, you end up defending yourself and your feelings. If I give you advice, you feel misunderstood instead of supported. And I don't get what I want either because I wanted you to feel better. 
it's pretty rare that you could actually talk somebody out of their pain. Rarely does the admonishment to look on the bright side actually heal things for someone. It just makes them stop telling you about their pain. It's so tempting to try to make things better. When somebody shares something painful, it's much more helpful to say, I'm sorry that's happening. Do you want to tell me about it? To be able to say, this hurts, without being talked out of it, that's what helps. Being heard helps. It seems too simple to be of use, but acknowledgement can be the best medicine we have. It makes things better, even when they can't be made right. So I hope that any of this was beneficial to you, inshallah. And um, I, I really want to end on a note of hope that there is so much hope. The fact that even all of us are here together diving into these uncomfortable conversations, that's a, that's a huge step. And um, I pray that we can continue this together. Jazakallah khair. Thank you, Sister Yasmin. Um, I think I'll be, so I'll be introducing um, Dr. Shady very quickly, if he could unmute. Um, just give me one second. Um, Dr. Shady, I don't have um, your uh, don't have your introduction on hand. Could you unmute very quickly? Yeah, of course. Assalamu alaikum. Um, sorry, give me one sec. Give me one sec. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so my name is Dr. Shadi Shabbat. I'm a psychiatrist here in uh, Michigan. Give me one sec, sorry. Uh, sorry, my kids are uh, just got home right now. So <laughs> they're making noise. They came home uh, about half an hour early. Um, but I'm Dr. Shadi Shabak. I'm a psychiatrist working here in Southeast Michigan. I work primarily in uh, Dearborn, Michigan with the Arab American community. Um, and I have a clinic in Dearborn, Michigan, which is known as a hub for the Arab American community um, here in the U.S. Um, and I'm a psychiatrist. I, you know, decided to become a psychiatrist when I was around 16 when I was in high school. I remember watching um, in a psychology class, there was um, a movie that they put on. It was as good as it gets with uh, Jack Nicholson, if you guys ever heard about it. And he had severe OCD, right, in the movie. So he would lock doors, um, uh, wash his hands. Uh, there was always a certain um, uh, pattern that he had to follow. And I remember watching it and feeling like puzzled because I did all those things myself, right? So I would flick lights before I slept like eight times. Um, I would uh, make sure my bed is exactly equal on both sides. Um, and it spent like you know, hours doing this stuff. And I thought everybody had the same thing. And I remember when watching that in high school, I was like, uh, I didn't know that was a problem. I thought everybody did these things. And uh, it kind of like triggered my interest and piqued my interest in psychology and psychiatry. And so when I went to med school, that was always my goal is to uh, study psychiatry and, and, and become, uh, you know, a psychiatrist uh, and to bring back uh, something to the community that I really like and cherish, which is the Arab American Muslim community and the Muslim community in general, of course. One thing that I've uh, learned in residency as well as practicing in a uh, Arab American community is I, I've, I've taken a lot of reverence towards culture. Um, the differences between one culture and another. And for the following reason, um, what you do in a community what kind of activism you do is not going to resonate 
um, if it's not culturally appropriate. And what I mean by culturally appropriate, not on the surface level of multiculturalism and all that. I mean culturally appropriate. Understand who your target audience is and what their culture is and not to criticize that culture heavily or else it will not lead to anywhere, any of the activism that we do. Even a clinic won't be successful if the psychiatrist or the therapist is not truly resonating with the culture. There's different cultures, and I'm gonna talk about two uh, primary cultures that we deal with in the US. There's a culture based on dignity and guilt, and that's where it's internally driven, and that tends to be in the Western societies. They, they tend to be dignity and guilt. Do you, be you, uh, feel you, do everything you wanna do, and just do you. That's one type of culture, minus England. England is one of the exceptions in the West that doesn't have that culture. The other culture is gonna be your honor and shame. And that's gonna be an external compass. So instead of internally driven, you're externally driven. How do people think of me? How do people react to me? And how are my actions gonna be perceived by others? And will I maintain my respect amongst the people? So that's honor and shame. Dignity and guilt is internal compass. Honor and shame is external compass. And those cultures are going to be found in North Africa, the Middle East, and the sub-Indian continent. For us to truly be successful in our activism, we have to understand that in our society here in the U.S., the predominant society is dignity and guilt. New immigrant communities from those areas are going to have a predominantly honor and shame-based culture. And instead of and these are two great cultures. This is not like one is better than the other. This is just, this is the defense mechanism of one culture versus defense mechanism of another culture. If we want to be successful, we need to see that and treat the honor and shame culture with respect and understand how to use the tools within that culture to bring about positive change, especially in the adult communities. Uh, first and second generation and third generation, they're all going to have a different um, acculturation. They're acculturated, right? So uh, immigrants who come are going to be more honor and shame. As they have kids and as they get acculturated, their kids may have more of the dignity and guilt model. We have to know who our target is. If our, if our target is the parents or the people who um, maybe our first generation, like myself, who was born here, but my parents were born um, in the Middle East, we still have some of that honor and shame. And in order to really resonate with someone like that, you need to use those tools within that cultural framework to bring about positive change, which means uh, maybe responsibility towards, towards family, uh, responsibility towards um, others. Uh, maybe you may have to involve family a little bit more in your, in, your, in your sessions. Things like that. You have to keep those things in mind. It's not a one-size-fits-all. And the solutions that we are often presented with are often based on a dignity and guilt model, respectfully so, because that's where we're at. Uh, but we need to reframe those sometimes in order to really resonate with um, the older uh, older folks so that they can also understand what these uh, issues may mean for them in terms of honor and shame and sort of re uh, inverting the honor and shame so that it could be something more positive in, in, this, in, this, in this realm. The other thing I wanted to touch base on is one of the things I don't want to uh, see is that a mosque becomes a place of uh, just another public health clinic where the constant talk is clinical stuff, whether it's mental health or suicide or depression. They need to be discussed, but there are some times where, especially what I've seen in, in, in my community, where it goes overboard and then people lose interest as well. We need to focus on two-pronged approach. We need to talk about these things in a healthy way, in a way that's uh, not glorifying um, mental illness, but also not making it seem like it's something that we should never talk about and should be in the closet somewhere. But we also need to have resiliency programs. We need to have uh, clubs where uh, young people can join and, and, and have fun with each other at a young age. You know, terbiyah doesn't start at the age of 16, which is something I've had to tell a lot of parents in my clinic. You have to start at a young age. And I think that's where mosques can be very, very beneficial, community centers, things of that nature, is to build resilience and confidence and a sense of camaraderie so that when someone is going through something uh, difficult, they know that they have someone to depend on. One of the biggest preventers of suicide is feeling a sense of responsibility to someone in your life, feeling a sense of responsibility to community, and feeling a sense of responsibility to family. If we can strengthen these things, strengthen community, strengthen family, and strengthen friendships, um, I think that's probably one of the most important things we, uh, that we would find true real results from.
right? Um, that's not to say that that cures everything, correct? That's where professionals come in and, 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 and psychiatric diagnoses and medications and therapy come in. But at, at a young age, we're able to create a, a resilient community, a community where there are mentors, where there are people that are not just mentoring you and talking to you about health and suicide and things like that, but also positive things in life and that you can have, you, you, you learn to have a backbone. Um, you know, we start at a young age learning how to defend ourselves against the external world, depending on the culture we're from, those defenses may look differently. But if we hone in at the young, at the, at, at, at a, at the youth, and create these types of programs for them where they can go and play sports or uh, have a club or enjoy each other's company, boys and girls, and, 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 and also not forget the importance of family and strengthening the family unit, um, these you're going to find a lot more resilient factors that come out from that. That is not to say that somebody who had it all, who had family, who had friends, is not at risk. That's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is the risk reduces when you have a whole community that's really close to one another. Um, as uh, brother uh, uh, Nasir had mentioned, you know, his brother was a very, very successful young man from a, from a school perspective, from an intellectual perspective. Um, you would wonder moving suddenly to another place. You would wonder if there's a genetic factor. You would wonder if there's many things that could have contributed to it. So I'm not saying everything is uh, definitely uh, something that we can stop or we can uh, we should have intervened here or here. It might be. I, I you know I'm not I'm not completely sure. But there are other factors like genetics, so bio, psycho, social, spiritual factors, correct? And it's not that one leads to the other. It's not that I'm born with a gene for depression, therefore I'm going to have depression. It's I'm born with a gene with the, for depression or I'm born for a gene with bipolar. Then my social environment is, is shaky. Then my internal, and then I wasn't really close with anyone at a young age, so my personal psychology is shaky. And when all these things are shaky, you, you're, you, you may manifest more of the illness or less of the illness, depending on where you're at in, in, in the triangle. And then that's where spirituality will come in. When someone is depressed, for example, because of a biological, psychological, or social issue, one of the symptoms of depression is guilt. And one of the things that guilt does is makes you feel that you're not spiritual, not faithful. And then that leads to a spiritual demise in that sense. It's not that I don't pray, therefore I'm depressed. It may be that I'm depressed, therefore I don't pray. Right? It, 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 it may be that uh, I'm uh, bipolar and I'm having a manic episode, therefore I think God is talking to me and telling me to hurt myself. So there are many factors. It's, it's, not, it's not like I don't pray, therefore I'm depressed, or I pray, therefore I'm not depressed. It could be one started first and led to the second. So we have to kind of really educate people on the entire, the holistic model of, of, of human, human development from the bio, psycho, social, and spiritual level, and each one has a very important role to play. Um, walking around and, and, and saying something is uh, a sin and this and that, it may not be the most prudent approach. It's important, so we know that religions that do say suicide is haram, for example, Catholicism, Islam, Orthodox Judaism, tend to have less suicides in their society. But we're not seeing so much of that in the West as much right now is that people may not even have a connection to the religion from a young age for that to even mean anything to them. Saying something is haram it may not resonate at all. So we have to find different approaches, different ways of bringing this topic uh, to people of various cultural backgrounds so that they, they can benefit and that they can, and we can uh, screen for these things early on. Um, and create an environment where their foundations are strong. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's funny. So I'm going to show you guys something that's going to look irrelevant. So I started this uh, hobby. Uh, it's like I, I, I take care of like these bonsai trees, right? So these are trees that if they were to grow in nature, right, these would be very, very big. They'd be huge trees, right? But we compact their roots and we put them in these little containers. And then what, what I find interesting is we wire them. So we put wire around the tree trunk, we wire the branches, and I've been learning to do that. And believe it or not, it's taught me a lot about myself and my kids, because as you wire, as you compact the roots, you build strong roots, you build a strong foundation for this tree for it to be able to flourish. Um, and then you wire the branches according to where it's already going. So you see a branch is curving to the left, you wire it more to the left, so you make it look 
the way you want. This is, I think this applies to raising kids, raising communities, raising families, um, is you have to build the strong roots. The foundation is tradition, culture, faith. But once the roots are built, what are you going to do with the branches? Because someone's roots could be, could be very good, but then they go astray or they do something that's not uh, um, acceptable or something that hurts them or hurts others. That's where you're continuously, when you're raising your kids, you're continuously pruning, you're continuously um, providing support. You're like that wire, right? The wire is providing support. You're not breaking the branches. You're not hurting. You're not putting pressure. You're going with the flow in a way that you're providing guidance. Um, and that goes back to what uh, Nasir, was, Nasir was saying about uh, sometimes our focus is a lot about success, success, success. And this is not a bad thing. The bad thing is that we push success, that we break the branches. You want to flow. You want to flow with, with the person and you want to uh, let them flourish, not constrain them so that they, 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 they end up breaking as they're trying to. Um, and this is a community-wide effort. This is in the Arab American communities, the Desi community. And believe it or not, stigma, uh, stigma uh, exists in every community. White community have, have their own type of stigmas. Black community, Hispanic community, and then our, our of course, uh, Desi and, uh, and, and Arab American communities have our own type of stigma. Uh, what is, what's important is to recognize where that stigma is coming from, to recognize why people may have that stigma, and then work with them in alleviating that stigma. Um, it's not enough to just tell people don't have a stigma, uh, don't do this, don't do that. We have to understand why stigma exists. Stigmas often exist and they have a, a, a mechanism for why they exist. We have stigma of things that we fear, that we don't understand, that we don't uh, really get. Um, and so therefore we develop stigmas to protect ourselves. Um, and by protecting ourselves from, from that thing, we create a stigma. And then we're finding that the stigma is not that protective. So we have to educate people to erase that fear uh, in order to dissolve the stigma without breaking a community so much that they completely collapse. Because now you're telling them, don't have stigma, but you're not providing an alternative or a reason as to why they shouldn't have that stigma. Um, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and, you know, I hope that you guys can get something out of that. Uh, I know it's an abstract way to describe certain mental health issues, but I, I'm more of an abstract kind of person. Probably why I, I really enjoy my field. Uh, um, I did see a, I know we're going to have questions and answers. Someone did ask a question about depression and if depression is uh, hereditary. It's multifactorial. Some people have several genes that may cause them to be depressed. Some people, um, it may be the social situation. So it's definitely multifactorial. It's multiple things. And the cure is, uh, is, is, is empathy, respect, tradition, um, you know, faith, as well as professional help, therapy, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and then, you know, of course, sometimes you, you do need to use medications. Um, with that said, uh, I uh, uh, want to send my deepest condolences to your family, and I want to uh, send my uh, deepest regards to everybody on, on this uh, talk. I want to thank everyone for who put this together, and uh, I'm blessed to have been invited to, uh, to speak uh, in this seminar. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so thank you, um, Dr. Shadi. Uh, now I want to um, have uh, Brother Kashif, uh, say one more, say uh, one thing, and then we'll get to uh, the Q and A session right after this. Assalamualaikum, everyone. This is your brother Kashif Fakhruddin, President of Islamic Center of Naperville. I thank Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for all His blessings and mercy in giving us the opportunity to address this very important topic. As we heard from Nasir, the mental health as a taboo subject in the Muslim community. And it leads to embarrassment and fear for the members of the community who do have mental illness as the embarrassment. This is a serious issue that needs to be addressed so that those who are suffering can get help needed. With that being said, I really would like to thank the Halim family for really coming forward and sharing this experience and helping us the entire community and be part of this initiative 
the community will be benefited. And we hope and pray that may Allah give the best sabr, the patience to the family, and the best place in Jannah for Arman. Another misconception in the Muslim community is that his mental health is associated with being non-religious uh, or not religious enough. Sheikh Rizwan mentioned, uh, talked about this, and many factors contribute to the development of mental health issues. So it's not fair to oversimplify this multifactorial medical condition this way and just associate and laminate with this uh, lack of uh, religion or following that. So I think it has to be a complete holistic uh, combination where what Nasir had mentioned that what we are learning that sometimes as a family, it's very difficult for us to understand what the condition and what the situation one is going uh, in uh, at the moment. So Alhamdulillah, ICN is leading this initiative to create a comprehensive strategy to, for mental health, mental health and the prevention of suicide. Along with what uh, Dr. Shady was saying, we have programs starting from middle school, high school, college professionals, and soon we are starting for the elementary age as well. So we encourage really our community to take benefit of these programs, continue to provide the feedback to us so we can, uh, we can improve. And as ICN initiative, we are uh, thankful to AMHP, CIGC, and we'll be looking forward to partnering with other uh, organizations so we can spread the message to our community. And we'll be uh, relying uh, to, you know, uh, Sister Tabassum, Brother Halim's family, their guidance uh, to have a, a program for our community that we can con continue to benefit. Alhamdulillah, today we have uh, more than 100 people uh, on this uh, Zoom session. It's getting uh, online with uh, Facebook. So our intention is or was, so this uh, can be a beneficial event and a Sadaqah Jariya for the Halim family. And uh, uh, with that, just this is not just a one talk as we are saying that ICN has the initiative. So there is a training coming up on December 19th. The training is uh, will be uh, organized by um, MHP, and we will be sending a dedicated email, and uh, Brother Shwe will be sharing the flyer as well. I'll just uh, bring up the flyer real quickly so you can take a look at it. It's really the, some of the ways we can help as a community member to. Uh, uh, let me just bring up the flyer. So we can we can help uh, the uh, be part of this mental health first aid certification program, the training. So we'll be sending this uh, email out uh, to all of you, so those who can register, and there will be more programs will be offered. So this is just not the one event. There will be different programs that will be offered for our community to learn. And I really thank everyone. I thank our Shayuf, our community, the the leadership. Uh, that allowed us to offer this uh, program and those have been uh, uh, the organizations as well. With that, uh, Nasir, back to you so we can have the Q&A session and then we'll have a reminder again with the flyer with the, uh, Brother Shoaib going over this. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Kashif. Um, Sister Yasmin and Dr. Shadi, if you guys could both unmute right now. Um, so we're going to have a 10 minute Q&A session um, unfortunately, like I went way over time <laughs> with uh, my part. So, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to um, cut that for time. Uh, but so how this is going to work. Uh, so just please put any questions on the chat. We'll try to get to as many as possible. I'll read them off from the chat. Um, and uh, like Sister Yasmin and uh, Dr. Shadi are obviously mental health professionals and I'm not. So. Um, I would uh, enc <laughs> encourage them to answer a lot of this. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, so we'll just get started here. So first question, um, is it normal for a 13 year old to feel depressed? Uh, 
Um, it's normal for adolescents to have periods and bouts of moodiness. Um, and adolescents were definitely a little bit more moody. Our prefrontal cortex has not fully attached to the limbic system. So the limbic system in the brain is where our emotions come from. So that's where we've become impulsive. And we remember as adolescents, we were much more impulsive. We would do things that we wouldn't even imagine doing now. And your prefrontal cortex helps control. It blows cold water on the limbic system. So it turns off the fire, right? When that connection is not fully there yet, you can have a lot of moodiness, a lot of agitation, irritability. Um, that's normal. What's not normal is um, being depressed clinically, correct? That's where you're having loss of appetite, poor sleep, or too much sleep. Um, you're having recurrent thoughts of death or dying. You may not have suicidal thoughts, but you keep thinking of death and dying, right? You may have self-injurious behaviors. You may cut yourself. Um, you feel low energy, poor concentration, uh, lots of guilt and regrets. That is not normal, right? That's, that's where you become clinically depressed. Um, and that's where someone needs to seek help. The precursors to this is maybe someone is starting to become more agitated or irritable before they become clinically depressed. That's where you seek, uh, you know, care from family. Maybe you go to the mosque, talk to someone about it. But as that, if it progresses and it becomes clinical depression with all those symptoms affecting your appetite, too much or too little food, too much or too little sleep, um, uh, constant aches and pains, uh, sadness, crying spells, um, over overly sensitive to things that you weren't before, losing interest in all activities that you used to enjoy before. That, that's not normal, no. So it depends on what you mean by depression. Is it normal to get depressed every once in a while or sad or something? Of course. When you lose someone in the family or when you get a bad grade or you are in a relationship and it ends and we know adolescents go through many relationships, uh, halal or haram, that's uh, not for me to decide, that's, that's, that's for the mashayikh. But uh, we know that those all things can influence someone's mood. So having a s bout of sadness for a day or two, that's normal. We, uh, I think as an adult, you should have some sadness. Uh, happiness is not, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, a necessity to be a healthy human being. You don't need to always be happy. That's, that's kind of Western positivism where everything is supposed to be always ha uh, dandy and happy. But when it becomes a problem is when it's clinically affecting your day-to-day -day life for a prolonged period of time. That becomes clinical depression, and that requires uh, care uh, and requires uh, professional care sometimes. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, this is a question from the audience. Um, I've had suicidal thoughts for 10 years, actively for eight years, um, and then has needed intensive help for three years. And the question is, when will they get better? Yes, ma'am. Do you want to address this one, or do you do you want me to? Oh, I, I defer to you if you're okay with that. Oh, okay. I, I think you have more knowledge. No, uh, we're all knowledgeable in, in different ways. Um, so, will it get better? It depends on what treatments have been tried. If it's constantly the same pills and the same uh, medications, it probably we need to start thinking outside the box a little bit go to some newer therapeutics. If, uh, you know, if you've been in therapy for eight years and it's not getting better and you're not, haven't been on any medications, it might be time to try something. Um, and the medications are not, so this is the problem with uh, talking about meds. So I believe in and revere and, and love therapy. I studied it. I, I, I enjoy the theories, psychodynamic theories, Jungian theories, all those things are very important to me. And I use them every day, even in a short medication check where I may spend 10 minutes with the patient, but there's a therapeutic relationship there. Um, but when it comes to meds, people are apprehensive. Um, I want to quell some of that. Some medications will have some side effects. If you're using certain medications like SSRIs, which are your Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil, those types of classic medications that we've all heard of, Celexa, Lexapro, or SNRIs like Effexor, uh, Pristique, these types of medications, or there's Wellbutrin, which is another class. There's a different class of medications. These are not addicting medications. Um, these do not cause addiction. They do not make you high. They do not make you lose your mind. You may not respond to one. You may have some side effects like abdominal pain to one, and then you just have to switch. Uh, but a lot of people sometimes get so apprehensive that they may go eight years or 10 years not getting treatment or only trying therapy in a situation where there may be more biological 
reasons for your depression, right? Because we talked about there's biological, psychological, social, spiritual reasons. And if you're not responding to therapy, then there may be uh, some biological issue that needs a biological regimen to go along with the therapy. So these are not medications to be terrified of. These are not medications that cause addiction. Um, there are some medications uh, like antipsychotics for schizophrenia or bipolar disorders that we may use with stabilizers like lithium. Those have more side effects, but again, what's the benefit versus risk uh, in the situation, correct? Is someone gonna be able to live constantly in states of mania and depression? Uh, and psychotic, psychosis and hearing voices, or will this medication, is it worth to try something that has some side effects? Then you have a third class of medications. These are addicting, and I uh, strongly encourage you to use them very limitedly, if, if none at all, it would be even better. Those are your benzodiazepines like Xanax, Valium, and things like that. But in the general scheme of things, our medications that for simple depression or bipolar are generally, they're not addicting but they may come with side effects and each person will have different side effects according to the regimen. Um, perfect. Um, so another question, it's a comment and a question. Uh, the first part of it is to, um, uh, so it, just an ask for the community not to talk and gossip um, since this is very prevalent in Desi and Muslim spaces, um, especially in regards to the stigma of mental health. And this question part of that comment was what happens when all of your kids say they feel suicidal at one point and one actually actively tried uh, before and is currently being treated? Okay, can you, can you ask it one more time? Um, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm trying to, so all the, the whole, the, all the kids of the family became suicidal at once? No, and not, not all at once. All, at least at one point. So the question exactly is what happens when all your kids say they feel suicidal at one point, but one actually actively tried before and is being treated? What happens? Yes. What, what would you, what would you recommend? Oh, okay. Um, and in that case, you want to really see, is there a family, is there a family lineage of suicide that goes back? Is this, is this very much genetic and biological as opposed to social or social mixed with biological? Because there are types of depression that are very much hereditary, uh, that are very much biological more so than they are not. Those types of depression, you're going to see more features that where someone's actual movements slow down, right? If someone starts to become very slow during their depression and uh, they become sort of catatonic, meaning that their movement just becomes so slow and blunted, that's gonna be more biological depression. You also wanna look uh, and see maybe there's a personality issue. Maybe, maybe the way the kids were raised and the defense mechanisms that they, 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 they learned, because that's another thing, right? Things like personality disorders, which are not really biological per se, they're, they're, they're based on internal psychology and, and, and defense mechanisms. Could that have played a role in maybe strengthening those? Because there's different types of suicide, um, such, uh, um, suicidal thoughts. There are some people who have suicidal thoughts as a, because they really are, de they're extremely depressed and they're at their lowest point that they've ever been um, and that they feel that that's the only way out. There are some people who have suicidal thoughts because they're psychotic. They may be hearing them. Dr. Shadi, I just, I, I just got a clarification. So it was, I think these suicidal thoughts happen because it was because of domestic violence. Right. So, right. And so then there's suicidal thoughts that come because of psychosis where somebody is not in the right state of mind at all. And they're having psychotic breaks and disorganized thinking and the voices are telling you to do harm, harm yourself and you don't have the mechanisms to fight back. And that could be one form. So one form is you're at the lowest point. One form is psychotic. And then there's a form that's, um, calling out for help. And those are generally gonna be due to personality disorders after witnessing traumas or being traumatized themselves over and over again, that they've learned that the only way that people will give them uh, attention, positive or negative attention, is when they act irrationally in this sense. That's not saying they're seeking and that we should just dismiss it. No, they're, they're calling out for help. It's that they want, they need attention. 
but they need the right kind of attention. So they may need someone who is able to structure them, to structure their ego, strengthen their ego, strengthen them, who this person is through therapy and through various techniques um, in order to bring them out of this as their go-to, right? I have a lot of patients that that's their go-to. If something goes bad in life, whether it's small or large, and it's very frustrating for a clinician. This is not easy when you're dealing with this because you're like, well, I mean, you're, you keep going to this. That's, is, that, is that your automatic, you know, go-to is I want to kill myself because something little happened in my life? Well, yeah, so something little can trigger someone to go to the extreme because they've experienced so many big things in their life. They've experienced sexual trauma or physical trauma or abuse or what have you, or war or uh, bullying or something like that. So then later on in life, any small slight that they feel uh, becomes magnified. And that, that requires a very thorough type of therapy that's, uh, that, to really you know, help this person out. And it requires a, a very patient support network because with that, anytime you, they may feel like you're like, so let's say I'm, I'm, I'm like that. And, and let's say, let's pretend I'm like that. Anytime I feel that someone is slighting me or saying something that I don't agree with, or that's, that I think uh, they're, they're, they're against me, I'll jump to the radical thing. I'll hate that person. I'll hate everybody about everything about them. And then I, I want to take that anger out on myself. That's more of a personality structure defense mechanism type of thing that requires in-depth therapy, less, less meds, more therapy in, in, in my opinion. So those are the three things that I think uh, I've summarized. I mean, there's, there's many different forms of why people commit suicide, but those are, I think, the big three. There's depression, psychosis, and then personality issues, uh, poor coping skills or defense mechanisms. Um, so thank you for that. Um, unfortunately, this is the end of the time that we have for Q&A. And um, so I would say anyone that has like an outstanding question, like please like reach out to us. Uh, and r right now I would like to invite Brother Shway Kadri, um, the immediate past president of ICN uh, for the closing remarks to this session. Thank you, Nasir. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for uh, joining this very important session. We had over 100 participants and we actually had to close. Uh, so just so you know, we will we have a recording of today's session and we will be posting it on ICN's YouTube channel, inshallah, and uh, we'll share that on the email. Uh, and also, as Kashif had mentioned, we are planning a mental health first aid training session. Let me share the flyer here real quick. Um, so this is planned for December 19th, and it's an all-day session, as you can see, from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, and we will be sending you a, a dedicated email and through all our uh, channels, through, for, uh, through uh, social media. Uh, but uh, anybody who's interested in very limited spots, so please register uh, in advance and please share this with others. Um, and I also wanted to uh, remind you of I, the resources that ICN has to offer. Jazakallah uh, khair, Sheikh Rizwan, for acknowledging for the hikmah when you said that you need a combination of spiritual as well as medical health. So for spiritual uh, counseling, of course, we have our shuyukh. Uh, and for, uh, for, for medical counseling, we have our family support services. We have our ICN free clinic. Uh, and uh, and uh, Dr. Shadi uh, very rightly mentioned that in order to reduce the risk that, you know, uh, I know you had mentioned that we want, you know, people to be more involved with the community. Alhamdulillah, ICN has many programs for the entire community. Please get involved, please participate. Um, and uh, last but not least, I wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, uh, Nasser and the Halim family uh, for the courage, for stepping up, for helping. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, give you sabr and uh, make this a, a, a form of sadaqa jariya for Arman, inshallah. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us, our families. Um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give, uh, like I said, sabr to your family, uh, to, to the Halim family and also uh, grant uh, Arman Janat al Firdos. Um, and I know there were a few more questions uh, out there that we could not get to. Inshallah, we will plan more sessions in the future. So please look out for the ICN emails. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to uh, end with a, with, a, with a short dua. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alaikum salam. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasnata fi al-akhirati hasnata wa qina azab al-nar wa atqin al-jannata ma labrar ya azizu ya ghaffar rabbil alameen. Amen.